Hi, Dr. Nielsen. Hey, Daryl. Hey, thanks for being part of our conference. Thanks for opening our conference today. Uh, we're very, very happy you're here. Can you tell our audience uh, what you do and where you do it? Sure. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be a part of this group. Um, so I am a urologic oncologist uh, currently practicing at the uh, UNC Lineberger Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I've been here since about 2008. Right. And it, pretty much every day you see prostate cancer patients or think about them? Uh, <laughs> definitely think about them every day. Um, and, and in my, in my clinical practice, it's, uh, uh largely prostate cancer, also, uh, some patients with bladder cancer. <clears throat> okay. And their families as well. Is that right? You see? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, everyone is involved. These are really, um, you know, really important, uh, conversations for all the people that care about the patient. And so, um, you know, over the last year and a half with COVID, there have been occasionally sometimes when it's been tough for us to have our usual um, uh, parties within the, um, the the consultation room. But we've been uh, creative around that with um, FaceTime and other you know ways to try to loop people in. So it's it's very much a family affair. So let's talk about that. And that's really what our conversation today is about. Uh, it's the second year in a row we're doing a virtual annual conference. Mm -hmm. In the past, uh, people come to New York City, spend a weekend in a you know, reasonably priced hotel, uh, but we feed our people better than they've ever fed before. And everyone has a wonderful time and comes home with actionable ideas that they bring back to their doctors and other mm -hmm. members of their family and friends that they care about. We're doing this online. You've been doing a lot of things online. Doctors around the world have been doing a lot of things online. How has that changed or improved things? You know, it's a really good question. Uh, I think there is um, definitely some, you know, real value in being able to be, you know, physically face to face with people. And um, I think that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the virtual world um, doesn't fully reproduce all of the you know body language and some of the other you know feedback that we can have um, when we when we meet face to face but that said I think that um, you know we all are getting a lot of practice in this world and um, you know particularly with the abil the ability to have uh, video um, conferences you know beyond just the you know sort of speaking on the phone um, I think that we're we're able to reproduce a lot of it and the thing that I think has been nice, um, in our practice is, you know, we often have patients who have other family members, you know, maybe, you know, adult children uh, who are far away. And um, there have been, and sometimes in the past, we'll, you know, sort of, you know, put the phone on speaker and, you know, have somebody else, you know, listening in with us. And we still sometimes do that, but we're, you know, more often able to do um, the, the video conferencing. And, and I think for a lot of patients, who end up traveling from a distance, we're able to do um, more of our work. Um, you know, some of some of the work we do in those consultations is hands-on, but a lot of it is really, you know, sort of talking and you know, working through ideas and questions and things that can be accomplished through these uh, through these media. And so, um, so I think in some respects, the you know, in the maybe thinking of almost as a silver lining of the pandemic, accelerating the um, the adoption of telemedicine and, and, you know, video visits and video consultations, um, I think in, in some ways probably reduces the burden uh, for, for many people in terms of, you know, travel burden and the ability to, um, you know, have, have more of these visits happen uh, at home. So, uh, so I think that we, we're doing the best we can, but I, I do think and I hope in the long run that we are able to, um, to preserve some of this because I think that uh, for a lot of our patients, um, you know, especially in our practice here, we have patients who come from many hours away in the Outer Banks and the mountains, uh, you know, other, other parts of our state. And to be able to have uh, points of contact that are, you know, personal in the sense of uh, the 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 face to face that we can do through video visits, um, it, it I think is a is a, a good thing. Yeah, and you know, it's not just the burden of transportation by time, you know, an hour, hour and a half. I mean, if you have to walk across the street, you still have to get dressed. 
You still have to think about when you should show up. You have Mm -hmm. to wonder, will the elevator open in time to get me to my doctor's office? Mm -hmm. And then you're sitting there not knowing when somebody's going to do a gentle knock on the door and walk in. Right. And, you know, I I mean, I know my blood pressure jumps uh, 10 or 12 points uh, as a consequence of that gentle knock. Mm -hmm. Do you have you? And your colleagues figured out any understanding? uh, Does the telemedicine opportunity reduce anxiety or just make for a better, more convenial kind of conversation between you and your patients? I think in many respects it does. Um, I think, you know, people are able to uh, be in the comfort of home. Um, you know, I, I think for all the all the things that you sort of listed out, I mean, the, you know, the travel, the parking, the check in the waiting room, you know, a lot of the things of the way that we have done medical care traditionally, um, are sources of friction, and I think, you know, tension for people. And to the extent that we can um, try to unburden our patients of you know, spending, you know, significant fractions of their lives in transit and waiting um, and, you know, bring care closer to where they're living and working, um, I think is a, is a good thing. And so I, I am hopeful that, um, that we're able to continue to, you know, really provide th- these kinds of services that have been um, sort of accelerated by the, the requirements of the pandemic. Yeah. And you mentioned the added convenience of inviting um, extended family or distant family. Uh, you know, you could imagine, I forget the cheesy TV show where, you know, the family's faces were, you know, on blocks on the screen. Um, I don't, I'm not going to struggle to figure it out, but the, you know, it sort of predated Zoom, I guess. Do you remember that? TV. I think I'm thinking Brady Bunch when you talk Brady about Brady Bunch. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Which Frank, I honestly never saw. But uh, see, but I, I, you know, we all have that iconic kind of opening in our minds. Mm-hmm. Does that reduce or impede the opportunity for a doctor and patient to have solo one on one conversation? You know, I think it really depends on the patient and their preferences. Um, I, you know, I really encourage patients to have someone join them, you know, whether it's their, you know, significant other or a friend or, you know, a a child or a neighbor, just another person with them. Um, Because I think, um, you know, number one, it's just a stressful thing to go through, you know, having these conversations and, you know, probably related to a degree to that stress, there's just a lot of information. And um, I think having, you know, more than one set of eyes and ears to help take it in and and process um, you know some of some of the information that we are trying to pass along in general can be helpful. That said, um, you know some patients have uh, you know very strong preferences where they you know wish to have those be you know private one-on-one with the physician and that's totally understandable if that's their preference. Um, but I think where, um, where we're able to have, uh, you know, another uh, caring person uh, involved in those conversations, it is often helpful um, because I think if, you know, for no other reason than those people who care about the patient will have a bunch of questions of their own and, you know, for the patient to have the burden of trying to, you know, remember everything and, and, um, and, and feel like they're, you know, communicating everything back to the people who care about them, it may just relieve that stress. Yeah. Another thing around COVID, I've been wondering, has there been a heightened understanding of uh, the role bacteria and viral infection plays when a person visits a hospital? And I'm thinking more around the idea of the transperineal biopsy has sort of become a trend conversation and may actually become the biopsy of choice, the mm-hmm. method of choice. Mm-hmm. What has COVID, how has COVID influenced how patients are treated within a hospital setting? Um, I think it's a great question. And I think, you know, in the hospital setting and just sort of in the, you know, sort of life in general, um, it was interesting last year that um, it really seemed like the seasonal influenza numbers that we've just become accustomed to almost taking for granted last year were very minimal uh, in in many areas because everyone was, you know, or most everyone was wearing masks all over the place. And we were, you know, doing more of the the, the practices to try to reduce the spread of COVID, which in turn, you know, reduced the spread of influenza and other uh, respiratory viruses. So I think it was sort of an interesting 
experience for all of us to see some of those other things, like for instance, flu, that um, you know really you know really had a, a sort of spillover benefit. And I think you know to your point of you know infections in general, um, you know these are things that um, we have in the you know late 20th, early 21st century, we have become uh, very uh, comfortable with the you know the amazing amounts of you know antimicrobials and you know antivirals and things like that. And we we haven't had a plague in a long time, but these are you know problems that humanity has had to deal with for all of human history. And so I think it's been you know sort of a humbling experience to see that and just reminds us of you know the the interface that we have with uh, infectious disease with respect to you know the biopsy and you know some of the other you know bacterial infections that we deal with um, you know that there's I think reasonable concern about uh, antimicrobial resistance and you know with respect to the prostate cancer biopsy scenario um, concerns that you know patients who are exposed to uh, you know multiple drug resistant bacteria may have risks of infections that would be harder to treat. So I think it's you know something that is a real important part of our practice in general. Yeah. And people from around the world access mail care things and undoubtedly will be watching, you know, this presentation and its archive on on YouTube. You know, I mean, we haven't seen plague in the developed world for a long time, but certainly there are parts of our planet that have experienced Ebola and uh, river blindness, you know, and maybe they're not technically plagues, but they're certainly devastating occurrences on wide scale. Yeah. Uh, but but certainly for us, for you and me sitting in the United States and for our viewers in Australia and Europe and South America and you know, on and on, it, it is a kick in the butt. We're, we're human, you know, and there are tiny little microscopic things that can kill us just as well as bullets and car crashes and such. Mm -hmm. you know, see, um, our audience is going to be concerned about, I mean, we, we do these conferences towards the end of the year with an opportunity to be optimistic about the following year. What can we, what, well, what have we developed in the last, in the year and a half we've experienced COVID and what can, and what can we build from those things? Um, in general or specific to prostate cancer? I mean, in specific to <laughs> prostate cancer, you know. Yeah, I think, you know, we, um, you know, we have just enjoyed a lot of success uh, in the research world, you know, developing um, new, uh, you know, new molecules to target, um, you know, new uh, pathways to, to treat men who have advanced disease. Um, we've developed new imaging modalities. And I think there's, you know, in, in the space of, you know, early detection and localized disease, there's been a lot of great work on um, image guided biopsies. You know, you mentioned transperineal biopsy. I think the, you know, the, the prostate cancer community has, um, hasn't has let up uh, despite the many barriers of, of the pandemic. You know, we've, it's been a while since we've had our usual spate of in-person meetings, but we've been able to, you know, keep moving the field forward with um, a lot of, uh, you know, collaborative work and, you know, virtual meetings and, um, uh, you know, progress is still, really encouraging and, and promising on multiple fronts. Yeah, th th does that surprise you? I mean, would a year and a half ago, would you have woken up and said, uh, gee, Dr. Nielsen, if you call yourself Dr. Nielsen in your dreams, you know, I mean, research is going to stop cold. Uh, we're not going to get patients to come in for trials. We're not going to do this or that. But that didn't occur. In fact, I mean, we have an NIH funded trial that is continuing and we'll read out in a few months. Uh, we didn't lose a single person because of COVID, you know, no. uh, over 400 people, uh, lots of, I imagine almost every trial currently running in any space has had the same wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. How how did we manage as a, as a scientific community? How did we do that? Well, I think there was a lot of um, agility and creative problem solving. And I think, you know, this is just really important work and um, you know, it, a year and a half or whenever it was ago, you know, February of March of, you know, 2020, when this all started up, I think, you know, all of us were, you know, deeply uncertain of, you know, what this was going to mean and how it was going to impact us. But I think once it became clear that this was going to be um, not just a flash in the pan, but something that, you know, would, would be something we'd have to, you know, really learn to live with, um, everyone just sort of got together and, and figured out, you know, creative ways to, to work around the, the barriers that we had. I think, you know, Many of us still have concerns, and we're you know we're, we're kind of waiting to see um, you know to what extent 
there was, you know, potentially some impact of, you know, patients, uh, understandably avoiding uh, medical care settings for a period of time in the pandemic and, you know, potential, you know, delays in diagnosis or things like that. But I haven't seen a lot of evidence of that so far in uh, in my own practice or in, in the literature. So I'm hopeful that um, with, you know, the, the rapid deployment of virtual care and, you know, other sorts of uh, innovations that were sort of uh, spurred on by the pandemic, that, um, that hopefully the impact of, of elements like that won't be too great. Right. And that sort of rhymes with the idea of something you uh, spoke of in a video uh, you did two or three years ago, perhaps, where you talk how uh, you spoke about uh, how the diagnosis uh, disrupts uh, plans and assumptions for patients and their families. Mm -hmm. COVID disrupted our plans and assumptions in a way that were, were extraordinary. Just as you've said, we might assume you know, uh, February 2020, we might have assumed, you know, research would would drop, uh, patients would scatter, and uh, you know, uh, incidents uh, numbers would rise, extre- you know, beyond what they are now around cancer because people were would be less likely to get find themselves diagnosed. Mm-hmm. Those assumptions didn't play out, and in that respect, the assumptions that we make as patients should be understood to be, you know, variable and, and sort of, you know, not etched in stone. I mean, does that make sense to you too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're, uh, I, I think we still have yet to be sure that, you know, the impact of those things was, um, not more serious than it seems so far, but, um, but I think, you know, people, uh, humans, are resilient, and um, I think you know that you know that resilience was really um, called upon a lot in the last couple of years. I mean, it's called upon a lot all the time for you know various circumstances, and um, you know as you mentioned, you know having, for instance, a prostate cancer diagnosis land in your lap, whether there's a pandemic or not, that's a pretty big shock. You know when when that news first drops, but then it's sort of a question of figuring out, okay, um, you know, how do we play this hand of cards we've been dealt? And, and you know, I think the pandemic just added a layer on top of that, but, um, you know, all these other uh, issues continue to to still happen. Yeah. Do you, do you think that you as, as the family urologist or as the patient's urologist has a role to play in building a patient's resilience? Um, I think so. I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, there's a, a, a bunch of different inspirational quotes. And, you know, Dr. Walsh uh, is was one of my teachers and he's, you know, shared his quote about the secret of patient care is caring for the patient. But I think, you know, one of my favorites is, um, you know, from research work in the sort of healthcare quality world, there's a guy named Davidis Donabedian who in the mid 20th century laid the foundations for the modern healthcare quality uh, system and, you know, did a lot of, you know, really, really serious research. Um, But one of his quotes uh, that I think really gets to the heart of it is that the secret to quality is love. And that, um, you know, that that the relationship between the doctor and the patient and the nurse and the patient and, you know, the the sort of doctor and the profession is one that is, um, I I believe, is not just sort of a job and, um, you know, is is really a a privilege and, you know, is is a, you know, really meaningful uh, and fulfilling opportunity and, you know, trying to help people um, play the hands of cards that they're dealt in these, you know, medical scenarios where, you know, we have uh, more information and, you know, can try to help them, you know, understand how to make sense of it and how to sort of integrate, you know, these things that happen to all of us into our lives, um, I, I think is part of our job. And so, um, so I think, you know, trying to be, um, <clears throat> you know, honest and clear about, you know, the situations that are sometimes serious ones, but at the same time, you know, preserving hope and and trying to help people see, um, you know, that you know many others have been able to navigate these waters, and that you know we're going to help them also. Yeah, no, that's very well said, uh, and 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 genuine. And I, I, I imagine many more urologists feel that, but find it difficult to express that, you mm-hmm. know, clearly with their patients. Let me, what what is hope? What does that mean in the prostate cancer context and in the context of you and your patients? 
Um, that's a really good question. I, you know, I think that um, just, uh, I, I think it means different things at different times. Um, I think that, um, you know, we sort of have an idea of the way that our life is going to play out and we, you know, have some, you know, plans and hopes and, and, and dreams for the future. And um, when, you know, sort of any health issue lands in the middle of that, um, uh, you know, it can be a big disruption. And so I think that um, there are, uh, you know, different patients, you know, handle that differently. Um, you know, some people, um, some people are very sort of analytic and data driven and, you know, are, 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 uh, encouraged along by kind of empowering themselves with lots of information. Um, some patients, you know, really look to, um, look to us to try to guide them more. And, you know, I think, you know, a lot of patients will say, you know, what would you do doc? Um, because we've seen, we've sort of seen this movie, uh, more times than they may have. And, um, and I think it's, it's a question of, uh, you know, trying to get a sense of where a person's at and, you know, what they, you know, sort of bring to it. Um, you know, some people have had, you know, personal experiences with, you know, other family members who've had uh, cancer diagnosis. And, you know, in the prostate cancer world, there are a lot of families where, you know, multiple male family members have had prostate cancer. And, and so I think, um, you know, when a patient has that, you know, that sort of in their background, and then this happens to them personally, um, their frame of reference is a different one than, you know, someone who's never heard of prostate cancer before. And so I think, uh, you know, a lot of um, kind of navigating through, you know, what hope means for a person depends on where they're at in the journey and, you know, what they bring uh, to the table in terms of their own experience and background and um, really trying to get to know them uh, on a real personal level, I think can, you know, help us uh, get to a point of, you know, giving the support that they need with the idea that, you know, sort of resilience and hope um, are a part of uh, the recipe for, you know, navigating through these challenges. Yeah. Patients when, uh, will share their conversations with their doctors, with their family. They'll say, Dr. Nielsen said this, or Dr. Nielsen had a funny joke about that, or, um, or Dr. Nielsen touched his hair, and I wonder what that meant. You know, did that, you know, is that like a, you know, like, you know, write your will kind of moment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you talk about and, and your colleagues, do, do doctors talk about their patients with their family? You know, how 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 much of a family relationship, how much what is the metric for understanding the fam how deeply a doctor holds a patient? Might that metric look like? Does that doctor talk about their patients with their family members? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, there are obviously a lot of uh, you know privacy issues that are in play for that kind of thing. Um, but I think uh, you know I, I I imagine that you know many doctors you know will will talk about you know some story that they heard or some you know some uh, sort of perspective that a, a person brought to the table. I, I mean, I feel like, you know, personally, I learn a lot from my patients, uh, you know, just about, you know, the way that they articulate, um, you know, their kind of vision for their life, the way that they, you know, express kind of, you know, understanding, uh, you know, some uh, adversity that they're tossed into, whether it's, you know, in the context of the specific thing we're talking about, or, you know, again, Kind of getting to know them as people and just trying to understand, you know, what what people have been through, um, and I think, you know, the the sort of you know search for you know meaning and and purpose in life is a, a basic human task, and um, and I think that you know one of the things that I love about my job is I get to, you know, meet people from all walks of life and you know all sorts of different experiences and um, have learned a lot from them. Yeah, and that's really good because people will think, oh, you know, the doctor's in it for the money or for the glory or even the social. I'm a social worker. You know, the social worker's just in it because, they, you know, they've got nothing better to do or some or, you know, or it's a feel good moment. But we learn so much. I mean, the growth that you, I and our, our colleagues have experienced from our patients is extraordinary. I mean, we're almost like growth vampires from with our patients. It, it's, you know, in a good in a very 
very good way, you know, uh, and and that helps us to be better clinicians mm -hmm. as well as better human beings, mm -hmm. you know, because our work is about helping people be people, you yeah. know, and and longer and happier, you know, as a consequence. Does that make sense to you, too? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, incredibly, you know, rewarding and fulfilling uh, privilege to be able to work with people in these, you know, sort of intimate, personal uh, ways and, you know, try to, you know, bring to bear, you know, research and technology and, you know, these other um, uh, tools that we have to try to help manage the problems on the sort of technical side. But I think, you know, no less important, I, I mean, I personally think probably more important is just um, you know, helping people as a you know fellow human being to just be able to kind of get through that and um, and be able to appreciate you know sort of you know what what matters to them in life. I rarely ask any doctor this because I wouldn't want somebody to ask myself ask me this, but the idea, I mean, you've as you said, you've seen this movie many times. You've gone through uh, probably a couple of thousand patients by now. Um, I'm up to like 1300 or so patients die. What's that like for you and for perhaps, you know, how do you deal with it alone with your family? Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it happens. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, um, you know, all of us die and it's, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, part of, you know, part of life for, for all of us. But I think for, uh, for the people where we, you know, become attached in kind of a caring relationship, um, when that happens, uh, whether it's from, you know, the disease we're treating or something else, uh, you know, uh, I, again, I think that, you know, for myself, I, I, I really, um, I really sort of gravitate towards, you know, getting very personal with people and those personal uh, connections can can make it sting and make it hurt and um and i think you know trying to you know be there with them and and be there with their families and and um you know just try to you know understand um my own grief uh is is uh, a challenge uh and you know and support uh their families even after um i think is something that um you know has been um you know has been really meaningful for me and it's not easy um but you know but i think that um, you know that's sort of part of what makes it special is that um, you know so no matter how this plays out you know we'll be there for you and and you know trying to kind of help help people you know navigate through you know along the way what can sometimes be difficult decisions and um, you know tough problems to solve and uh, and and I think that you know sort of personal relationship um, makes it such that you know when when there is a death, uh, it, it, it hurts and it, it's a, a, you know, a real thing. Yeah. Do, do, most deaths occur within the context of a medical oncologist. Um, do you feel sort of divorced from, uh, some of the, uh, care that you might offer to a patient as they're in their last months of life? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And I think, you know, in the prostate cancer world, um, there are many urologists who, you know, who do the sort of full continuum of, you know, of care, including, um, you know, the new systemic agents and things like that. And in many environments, the urologist sort of provides the whole spectrum of care. In our practice, um, we have superb world-class medical oncologists specializing in prostate cancer care. And so, uh, so I will tend to defer to them in terms of, you know, the, the sort of management of, of those sorts of things. But I personally like to stay very much involved, uh, you know, more like, you know, we see patients in an integrated clinic. So if one of my patients, um, you know, progresses to advanced disease and is seeing one of our medical oncologists, they're seeing them on a, on a day when I'm there typically. And so, you know, it's, it doesn't take much to, you know, just drop in and say hi, or, you know, catch up with the, the medical oncologist, find out th how things are going. Um, for myself personally, uh, I actually was sort of surprised to end up going into surgery and thought when I was coming into medical school that I was going to do uh, medical oncology or hospice or palliative care because my um, my main mentor uh, when I was an undergraduate was a general internist who was the medical director for our county hospice. And I spent a lot of time with him and 
made a real big impression on me. And, um, and so I sort of, I lean into that stuff, uh, uh, maybe more than some, but, but there's actually a, a pretty significant, um, uh, movement within the urologic oncology world of, you know, really recognizing the importance and the value of that. And it's interesting. Um, there's actually the person who is sort of recognized as the father of uh, palliative care in North America uh, is a man named Balfour Mount, who was a urologic oncologist in Canada. And, um, you know, in the you know 80s, you know, late 70s, early 80s, um, he spent a lot of time uh, with uh, the, the folks in the UK who were starting the modern hospice movement. And so I think, you know, for urologists, as compared to um, a lot of other surgeons, because there's not a corresponding medical specialty, um, you know, like sort of cardiology, cardiac surgery, you know, things like that, you know, for urology, we sort of are, are it, you know, from the screening, you know, detection, you know, treatment and, and follow up. And I think a lot of people are attracted to urology because of that, you know, because the, you know, the, the relationship is a really big part of it. You know, we can do, you know, really incredible things with technology and, you know, do surgeries and things like that. But we also, you know, meet the patient sort of at the front door when their, you know, primary care physician has um, some, you know, question from a, you know, screening test or something like that. We, we sort of, you know, follow along the way. So I think that um, urology in general has uh, a long tradition from Dr. Mount to, you know, many people today of really uh, sort of seeing that as just an extension of what we do uh, in terms of patient care. And I think for myself personally, it's definitely um, a space that I'm interested in. All right. As we start to wind this down, can you share some of perhaps an anecdote without identifying anyone, of course, of, of what an intervention or, or conversation or something that you did that just sort of helps you get up in the morning and get to work? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I <laughs> wanted to be sensitive to any kind of identifying information, but I think, um, you know, I have, uh, uh, I, I've had, you know, a few patients, uh, I, again, my practice is sort of a mix of, of prostate cancer and bladder cancer. And in, in my bladder cancer practice, it, it's, it is unfortunately a little bit more frequent to have patients where, you know, in the uh, not long period after initial diagnosis and treatment, there is a, a subset of patients who can have pretty rapidly, you know, seriously progressive disease. And I've had uh, a number of patients in in that context where, um, you know, we have uh, sort of navigated through that together and, you know, had uh, sort of, you know, tearful conversations with family to, you know, sort of figure out, you know, how to how to make uh, some difficult decisions. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, it's, it is hard to feel like we can't fix the problem. You know, we, we, we like to fix things and, you know, those, those spaces are uncomfortable spaces, but I think it's just, you know, incredibly, you know, meaningful. And it's, as I have, um, gained more gray hairs, I, you know, I feel like, you know, those kinds of experiences and relationships help me, you know, sort of bring myself in a, you know, in a different way to the people I'm taking care of now. And so I, I, I think it's sort of a, uh, there, there's a, an old quote that uh, life is short, but the art is long in terms of the art of medicine. And um, there's a lot of art and a lot of uh, experience that, that I think, you know, we uh, can sort of bring to the next patient we see. Well, thank you for your art. Thank you to you for your for teaching your colleagues and uh, how to develop their art from their experience with their patients and thank you for um, leading you know awareness of the importance of heart and hope in a in a patient doctor relationship. We're very grateful for that. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the great work that your organization does. And, um, you know, just really, really special to me to, to have groups like yours out in the world that can help support patients and, you know, help them kind of navigate through because it's a, it's a team effort. It's, you know, the doctors can't always do everything. And I think, you know, having a community of patients and fellow travelers is so valuable. So it's, it's really, really great that you have that. Yep. Well, welcome to our faculty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. All Bye. right. Thanks so much.